thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thank you for having me here today. And um, so I'm going to introduce them one by one before they speak. I'm going to start with Lillian Salerno. Lillian served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Rural Development in the Department of Agriculture from 2011 to 2017. Lillian is also a longtime pioneering entrepreneur and was the co-founder and COO of Retractable Technologies, a medical device manufacturer based in Texas. While working with Retractable, Lillian worked extensively with Congress and with competition enforcement agencies in Washington in a long effort to address concentrations of power in the medical device industry. Lillian is currently running for Congress in Texas's 32nd district. That is the seat that's held by uh, Pete Sessions. And she was recently featured in Vanity Fair magazine. Great. Thank you. And thank you to Barry Lynn and the folks here at Open Markets. This is the most important work that we do in Washington is right here in this room. And when I'm elected in Congress, this is what I'm going to be working on 24-7. So just so you know. I want to take us back to a time in the late 1980s. That's when um, my company, we invented the first retractable syringe. And I want to tell you all why we did that. In the 1980s, there was an HIV epidemic where every person that got HIV, it was a death sentence. There was no treatment. And for us that had friends that were, had HIV, we were concerned. How could this have happened in this country? So my partner, who was a talented engineer, and I called the National Institute of Health and said, you know, we're out here in Louisville, Texas. Our childhood friend has HIV. He's not going to make it. A 24-year-old girl in our office got HIV from reusing a syringe because she was an, uh, addicted to opioids. Is there anything we can do? And they said, you know, we got a real problem. The standard syringe is a bad device in an AIDS epidemic because people reuse it and because nurses won't go treat AIDS patients because they're not protected and they're scared that they'll get HIV. And the big manufacturer, they're not working on this. And so my partner went down to the pharmacist bought some standard syringes, started throwing them at a dartboard in our office, which was a little dangerous for us that were walking by. But he was, came up with the patents for the first retractable syringe. We worked with Parkland Hospital, which at that time had three floors of HIV positive patients. And we had the nurses tell us, not the focus groups that the monopolists had, not a bunch of engineers that weren't treating patients. We had the nurses tell us what they wanted in a syringe, and we came up what is, was then and now the world standard for how to give an injection in this country, but we didn't have the right uniform on. We didn't have the right uniform because we didn't have access to the market, which was controlled then and still now by a monopolist that has over 80% of the market. And instead of getting a hero's welcome and being on the cover of Time Magazine, because we invented a way to help nurses and protect workers, we've spent the last 20 years mired in litigation, going to our congressional delegations, going to the FTC, going to the DOJ, and asking for help, and we've been denied every time. And in the money, it was never about the money. It's never about the money when you invent something for a purpose. But guys in Washington, D.C. that are in some of these agencies, their hands are tied because of the political corruption and influence that we've allowed. So I definitely, I met a young FTC employee here in this audience, and I feel bad because how can they do their job if they, no one has their back? And so I spent 20 years, my son's 20 years old. I came up here for the first time when I was four months pregnant. I went to my first FTC meeting and asked for help. I brought them documents. After the monopolist settled with my company, I sent all the documents up here. I sent them evidence. And you know what they said because of the Chicago school? Lillian, it's about pricing. 
It's about prices. We need these guys who are real big. They make a lot of stuff and we can get our costs down. And I would always say at the expense of who? Of the nurses that are treating HIV patients or the 14 year old that accidentally got involved and now he's got HIV and just instead of just being a drug addict. Your pricing model and your idea that this country can survive without innovators like folks that I've worked with in my career is horse rubbish. And so I'm telling you, I was that canary in the mine. The system's broken, and we need to take our country back by fixing this problem. Thank you. And our next speaker is Kim Mai Cutler. She's an operating partner with Initialized Capital, an early stage venture capital firm, where she's in charge of marketing and outreach for portfolio companies. She's also a contributor at TechCrunch and is best known for her work covering the intersection of tech and San Francisco Bay culture, politics, housing, and racial diversity. She's worked for Bloomberg, VentureBeat, and the Wall Street Journal. Hi. Um, so a little bit of background about myself. I'm part of an early stage firm that was started by a couple partners from Y Combinator, which is uh, the premier kind of incubator for early stage companies in the Valley. Um, before that, I was a tech journalist uh, covering the industry for about 10 years or so. And I also come from a family that has really deep roots um, in, in the technology industry. Um, we've been in it since, for 70 years, and my grandfather worked with uh, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, and my mother was a refugee who came to the Bay Area and then eventually worked as a software engineer in what was a largely male-dominated field. Um, so today, I, I would like to speak a little bit about my experience in covering one particular company over the past 10 years, because it's the one that I have the most um, kind of direct firsthand uh, experience with, and that's uh, Facebook. Uh, so back in 2009, I moved back to the Bay Area to shift from covering finance into technology. Um, and I started covering the emergence of this new Facebook platform, um, which had just launched a year or two prior. Um, and I want to speak to a couple of events that happened over the course of that period that kind of outline the, the, the power that, that that company has today over the larger uh, tech ecosystem. So when I first moved back, one of the very first stories that I broke in 2009 um, was a, a story um, about how Facebook was changing distribution practices for game developers. Um, and at that time, there, it, the platform had become overrun with uh, what then TechCrunch editor Michael Arrington called Scamville apps that would let social gamers uh, buy virtual currency by signing up, unwittingly signing up consumers for offers that they would have to uh, have recurring payments on. So Facebook changed the distribution rules, and from a consumer perspective, um, you know that seemed like a better user experience decision at the time. But it also set a precedent that the industry has come to kind of normalize and accept over the ensuing decade, which is that Facebook can change its distribution rules without a lot of uh, transparency or accountability around um, around that. And that's something that companies have come to know over over many years. And it's something that we see, you know, as a venture investor, if you're looking at a company. Um, you want to war you warn young companies, don't make your distribution or user acquisition methods wholly dependent on a single platform. And so like over the years, we've set, seen many companies, media companies, uh, video apps, um, e-commerce and t-shirt sales companies, um, you know, they'll have a couple amazing quarters because they find some kind of loophole in the distribution system, get a huge amount of reach, and then it gets shut down and then they kind of crash and burn. Um, but you know, those are about companies that have adjacent kind of practices built on the platform. So I want to get a little bit more specific and talk about uh, companies that are more directly competitive uh, with Facebook. So I'm going to talk about three companies or three acquisitions that happened over the course of 2012 to 2014 um, while I was uh, reporting and also an editor, uh, uh, you know, reporting on Facebook. So um, the funny thing is, uh, when we talk about the story of Snap and Snapchat, um, I, the first place I had actually heard about that company, about Snap in general, was not through a venture investor. It was not through uh, a consumer. It was not through another entrepreneur. It was actually through um, my roommate at the time, who was a product manager on the growth team at Facebook. And he had mentioned in early 2012 that there was this app that was taking off um, that, that had caught Mark Zuckerberg's attention called Snapchat. And so I assigned um, an intern on staff to it who is conveniently a fraternity brother of Evan Spiegel, uh, the Snapchat founder. Um, 
And what was interesting about that is it emerged at a time of both great success and a lot of uncertainty for Facebook as a company. The company was about to go public um, after uh, eight years, but it also had kind of an existential crisis. It didn't know, it didn't, it was unclear whether the company would be able to transition from web-based platforms to mobile platforms. They didn't have a, they didn't have a mobile operating system like iOS or Android. They didn't have a, you know, a phone, although they had tried several times to build one. Um, and most of the revenue came from web-based advertising, not mobile. And so like Facebook was going to have to be some type of layer that was higher in the technology stack where it could remain vulnerable to upstart competitors, um, one of which at the time was Instagram. Um, and Instagram, I knew the Instagram, Instagram team very well. Um, the co-founder of Instagram met his wife at a housewarming party I threw like 10 years ago. Um, and in less than 18 months after they launched, Facebook acquired Instagram uh, for a billion dollars. Um, from the learnings from that, a, a lot of developers were learning that, again, this lesson of not distributing your, or acquiring users wholly on Facebook, they were learning to acquire users in different ways, and that was obscuring the visibility that Facebook had into emergent competitors on other platforms. So around the same time, I also met another company in early 2012 called Anavo um, at uh, Mobile World Congress. Um, so this was a data compression app that was backed by top tier venture firms called Sequoia Capital that would help consumers make better use of their data and save money on their phone bills. Um, but later towards the end of the year, they learned that um, they, they had pivoted their product more towards a data and analytics service that could provide real-time insights on adoption and traction of mobile developers. Um, and they could do that through interpreting the aggregate usage of, of their uh, mobile data compression app. And so they would send me these really interesting stories that no one else had with proprietary data, um, on things like which e-commerce apps were breaking out, out of, after Black Friday. Um, and then in December of 2012, they sent me a really interesting story that no one had, which was a map of the whole entire world showing various penetration of different messaging apps globally from Japan's Line to South Korea's uh, Kakao Talk to another Silicon Valley-based messaging app, which was called WhatsApp. And shockingly, the thing that was surprising about that, that app was um, Facebook was actually doing quite poorly. Messenger was losing outside of the US. And so I wrote an article on it. And unbeknownst to me at that time, that article became a significant part of the internal case that Facebook would then use to justify the acquisition of Anavo and then uh, WhatsApp for $19 billion a couple months later. Um, and so, you know, these companies form kind of a larger apparatus in which Facebook has a very sophisticated way of monitoring, monitoring um, emergent competitors with promising engagement statistics that, you know, even if those, those applications are only a few weeks old, and they, and they can identify them, you know, within a month or two of, of them having meaningful engagement and retention usage. And so, um, you know, there's some, you know, there's some positives and there's some negatives, obviously. I mean, some are, you know, the adventure community has shifted away from making, you know, a lot of these significant investments in this consumer internet space. Um, around like mobile, social, and local apps. And as someone who comes from a deep tech family, there's some that, that shifting the investment practices and what people are starting in the industry. But on the other hand, um, the latest wave of oncoming uh, tech, um, you know, I think machine learning and um, antitrust theory, you know, could arguably be on a collision course of sorts because um, to, to be at the forefront of that wave, you not only have to have talent, you have to have data and you have to have large live systems that can interpret mass quantities of data from millions or even billions of users. And so the concern is that the economic value that comes from consumer data is far in excess of the value that consumers get in return. And that leads to a compounding advantage for the company and ultimately possibly less consumer choice uh, due to less competition. And so, you know, you know, I've come to know Facebook executives the last decade. I like a lot of them, but you know, this isn't a question of good intentions. It's a question of, of checks and balances and power in a democratic society. Okay. Next, we are going to hear from Ross Baird. Ross is the founder and CEO of Village Capital, a firm that finds and invests in entrepreneurs solving the most important problems in society. Ross is the author of The Innovation Blind Spot, in which he shares the stories of hundreds of entrepreneurs and investors he works with across the United States and highlights the problems surrounding the way in which, in which investors invest in new ideas. So I want to tell you a story about another entrepreneur, and his story is not different from Lillian's. Uh, his name is Jerry Namorin, and Jerry was a Haitian refugee. Um, 
grew up in South Florida, and he saw his mom, he's 11 years old, and he saw his mom consistently get ripped off by payday lenders, um, auto lenders, essentially large organizations that could rip off a Haitian refugee who didn't speak English very well. Um, and he says, you know what, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go inside the system and figure out how to fix it. So he's first in his family, go to college, goes to work on Wall Street, really understands how consumers can resettle their debts. Goes to University of Virginia and Charlottesville for business school and he starts a company called Lend Street. And he learns while he's working on Wall Street that if you know what you're doing, if you know how to work the system, you can actually go to the credit card companies or the big banks and refinance your debt for 10, 20 cents on the dollar. Um, rich people know how to do this, poor people typically don't. So Larry, so Jerry sets up a consumer advocacy company and, and, and goes out and he talks to several hundred investors to raise money for it. The company's name is Lindustry. Um, and he's unsuccessful. After about two years, he hasn't raised a dime for his company, even though it makes a lot of sense. So I meet Jerry and I say, uh, Jerry, this seems like a great idea, what's going on? And he says, you know, the, the investment world is all about pattern recognition. Uh, venture capitalists, people who fund startups say that all the time. Like, it's a good thing, I've, I know what I'm doing. I've, I've seen a winner, I know, I know what the next Mark Zuckerberg looks like. Let me break it down for you. I'm a black guy, I live in central Virginia, and I'm solving poor people's problems. I'm 0 for 3. And whether it's Lillian or whether it's Jerry, you know, there is a myth that if you go out and you have a great idea and you work hard, you can build a business. Um, but Jerry's 0 for 3 not because he's a, not a hard worker, not because he doesn't have a great idea. There are macro systems going on, and I did not know much about monopoly or concentration. I come from the startup world. I started a venture capital firm. Um, when I started reading what Barry and team were putting out there, there were a lot of macro things that explained a lot of what I was seeing every day, trying to help entrepreneurs across the country build businesses that I didn't know until, until I saw it. So let me break down through the lens of monopoly, why Jerry and thousands of Jerry's, Lillian is a Jerry, and thousands of Jerry's across the country are, are unable to get their business off the ground. Um, number one, look at the region. Jerry starts his company in Central Virginia. Um, nearly 80% of investment in new ideas goes to three states, New York, Massachusetts, California. Um, sources of capital for new ideas have largely consolidated over the last decade. Community banks used to fund people like Lillian and Jerry and they've declined 50% in the last 10 years. Um, Large banks uh, largely back venture funds and they require minimum sizes, meaning a $30 million startup fund in Nebraska is very unlikely to attract any kind of meaningful resource. There's, there's, a, there's a regional problem going. Um, there, Jerry, as a black guy, less than 1% of people who raise financing for new ideas are African American or Latino in our country. 2% are women. Um, and it's largely because the people making decisions over where capital goes, um, it's lar largely represent those demographics. For example, um, black-owned banks, and there's been some excellent work in the Washington Monthly on this, are a devastating casualty of consolidation. Um, finally, when Jerry says he's solving poor people's problems, um, it makes it very, very difficult to raise money because if you're in the startup world, we've essentially got a cartel that largely only wants to find its businesses that will be acquired one day. So if you go to any startup pitch fest, think of Shark Tank. People ask all the time, what's your exit strategy? It's the first question you get if you're an entrepreneur trying to raise money today. That, the first question they ask you is who will buy your company? Um, if you want to be the next WhatsApp, they essentially are saying, what are you building that Facebook will want, or Google will want, or Amazon will want, so they can acquire you one day, and even if you're starting a company in Indianapolis, or Texas, or Central Virginia, they'll strip the assets, they'll move the people to New York, or San Francisco, or wherever the headquarters are, and it'll be like it never happened. And so, you know, part of what, I wrote this book, The Innovation Blind Spot, and every day we, we have a relatively small firm that's investing in trying to turn that 0 for 3 story around, but Without these macro changes we're trying to make here, it's, it's never gonna happen. So I'm, I'm grateful to be working on this problem with y'all. Thank you. Yeah, our last speaker is Frank Pasquale. He is a professor of law at the University of Maryland School of Law. And his research addresses the challenges posed to information law by rapidly changing technology, particularly in the healthcare, internet, and finance industries. 
He's a member of the NSF-funded Council for Big Data, Ethics, and Society, and an affiliate fellow of Yale Law School's Information Society Project. His book, The Black, Soci the Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information, develops a social theory of reputation, search, and finance. <coughs> Well, I gotta say it is a great honor to be here and I love being on this panel because the very last sentence of my book on the Black Box Society says that we cannot have a US economy run by the Quants of New York and the coders of Silicon Valley. We've got to distribute power. Now, the book looks a lot at the nature of the finance industry and the tech industry. And one of the things that's most interesting to me is that we've actually done more in many ways in finance to try to distribute power than we have in tech. We have concepts and laws regarding the separation of banking and commerce that go back to the 19th century and that to this day are still critical to our discussion of finance regulatory policy as I described in my testimony before the Senate Banking Committee back in September about um, ILCs and, and you know, the way we separate banking and commerce. My question that I want to pose in the tech realm, and I'll be complementing the earlier work on Facebook with some reflections on Google, is can we think about the importance of entities that fund innovation, and can we think about, in a parallel way, what are the entities that find innovations for us, that find companies? What is funded and what is found is critical in today's economy. And what I find happening is that there is visibility capital, the ability to show up in Google search results, in Facebook ads, targeted well. That visibility capital is being concentrated more and more in some of the largest firms in our society. Now, that would be bad enough, but as Senator Warren says, it's not a priority of our antitrust enforcers now to look at that critically. I think that the FTC really missed a huge opportunity in its Google investigation in 2012, and I wrote a whole article about why it failed to explain its inaction. But what's even worse is, it's not simply a question of not going after the right entities. We now have reached a point where the FTC is actually actively helping Google police firms that resist it. Okay, so there's a case called 1-800-CONTACTS. Very long story short, in this case, you had a group of contact men's manufacturers that were each sort of advertising on each other's trademarks. They decided they all sued each other. They settled the case. And then the FTC came in and said, oh, that looks like a collusive settlement against Google. We're really worried that you're depriving revenue from Google and search engines, and we're going to go after you. Okay? And what that message that they send, and I'm saying as a matter of like, like black letter antitrust law, you know, I think they've got a lot of great arguments. On the other hand, as a matter of setting priorities for an agency, which is well within agency discretion, it's a terrible decision. And you know, I, would, I think that when we look at how innovation, data, and privacy work together, it's particularly troubling. Because what we're facing is a future where potentially you have a model of the economy endorsed and embraced by technocrats in both parties that values the concentration of information and data so that very, very large firms and entities know as much as possible about consumers and producers and are somehow ordering things to be as efficient as possible. That's the premise of a lot of these FTC case and 1-800 contacts, and I think the premise behind a lot of their work in the area is just sort of assume that these very large platforms are working on behalf of consumers. As people like Ariel Azrahi and Maurice Stuckey have shown, that's really not a great assumption. They show it through game theory. There's other empirical research that sort of challenges that assumption. But I think we really have to look at it. And fundamentally, we have to wonder, you know, if we really think that mega platforms with the most data possible, that that's the key to the future of the economy, we may well be giving up on capitalism and markets altogether. Right? Andrew Lisko gave a paper on this where he said, if you've got one firm that knows everything about its suppliers and everything about its consumers, well, they're just going to be able to essentially set one against the other or set off suppliers against one another and know so much that they're re really running the economy. And my last tweet that I just uh, tweeted, I, I linked to an article I just published today about the stakes of digital monopolies. And the stakes to me are this, that if you allow data and power to concentrate in these mega firms, you're essentially moving to a, so they're playing a role as sovereign. They're not market participants anymore, they're running the relevant markets. So if we want to take that seriously, if we want to create a society where you have actual government sort of setting the rules of markets, as opposed to private entities setting these rules, then we have to take seriously all of the arguments that were made on this panel, 
We have to decentralize. We have to have a much better industrial policy and competition policy on data and computing. Thanks. All right, we've heard from all of our speakers the different ways that concentration has a devastating impact on innovation and entrepreneurship. And Open Markets has called on the FTC to block Facebook from making any more acquisitions pending further notice. By my count, Facebook and Google together have bought nearly 300 companies. So what I wanted to start off by talking about is if the antitrust agencies were willing to do so, which mergers should they revisit? Which mergers have been the most problematic for innovation and entrepreneurship? I'm going to start with Frank. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, the Facebook sort of acquiring both uh, Instagram and WhatsApp is troubling to me because I think we can't just sort of look at this as, oh, there's going to be more and more efficiencies due to the data that it gathers. You're like, it not only can personalize ads to you based on what it knows about you on Facebook, you can personalize ads based on what it gets from WhatsApp and from Instagram and all the rest. What we have to realize is, as Ryan Kahlo and many other scholars show, all of the benefits of personalization could be counterbalanced by vulnerability-based marketing, right? It's not as if these, uh, these companies are just <coughs> gathering data on you to serve you. You know, I remember that old uh, uh, science fiction story where the aliens came with a book uh, uh, called To Serve Man. Right. It turns out it was a cookbook. Right? <laughs> and I think that's deeply troubling. I, I, I also think that, you know, if you look at, for example, Facebook's recent acquisition of TBH, a teen positivity po polling app, this is a little company, you know, and yet they got, they snapped it up before it went over the HSR uh, standard. I think it was like valued at 80 million probably. That's what people were speculating. And they should really look into that because part of what that's about is trying to make sure that kids don't experience anything else, right? You sort of try to grab every potential spot so it's all within the sort of Facebook ecosystem. I think those are very troubling. I can go further, you know, later. I don't want to take too much time, but Google, double click, and YouTube also worth revisiting, worth thinking about more critically. Um, I mean, I don't know if I would go that far to say, like, they should stop all acquisitions. I think the point, the broader point that I'm sort of making is. Um, one of the instrumental lessons that Facebook as a company learned from the Instagram and Snap and WhatsApp situations is to be incredibly preemptive. So they do actually go, they can, they can actually identify, duplicate, or acquire companies like before the venture community or before the broader public is even aware of them. I don't know exactly how that would, you know, I, I, I'm raising that broader concern. I'm not sure, I'm not a lawyer, so I wouldn't know how to exactly implement that um, in the TBH case, I'm not. You know, I'm the, the what I understand from the dynamics of that situation is maybe the team wanted to sell and had been at it for a while. Like I'm trying to, I mean, I can't speak for them, but I mean, every case is a little bit different. Like there are certain cases where, you know, a product might be like six or eight weeks old and has engagement metrics that are concerning to Facebook, so they move fast. And then there are other cases where a team has been been at it for a really long time and it's really hard to raise follow-on capital. Um, I, so guess one, choose, yeah. I guess one question I would ask, and maybe for Ross or Lillian, is why, why is the capital so hard to raise? And I think it's because there's this self-reinforcing right. and self-fulfilling prophecy of complete domination of the space by the big yeah. giants. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as a follow-up on that point, I think you're exactly right. The, the mergers I would revisit would be actually the wave of bank mergers post-2009, um, where very large banks were bailed out and most small and medium banks were not and then were rolled up and acquired by big banks. So part of the reason why companies that have been at it for a while and are exhausted and can't extend it and can't raise financing, that used to be what community banks did. Community banks have declined 50% across the country. So I'm running an interesting you know, technology company in Kansas City and I need some, you know, I need some a line of credit to fill X Y Z purchase order. And this community bank used to say, "Well, you've been at it seven years, and I know you're good for it." And that those were the banks that went under in 2009, 2010. And you all of a sudden are far too small for J.P. Morgan Chase Consolidated to lend to now. And so your choice is either continue killing yourself and have your family hate you, or sell to. Monsanto or Facebook or whoever. So, so sources of capital have become highly, highly concentrated and, and it's, it's a massive problem. Well, again, I'm, I know more about the healthcare market, which is screwed up as the technology market, as you all probably know when you go to pay your premiums or 
go to the doctor or see the whole system, but part of the problem what you're seeing in the healthcare market is this consolidation problem, and that's part of what the FTC and DOJ, they need to, when those mergers come, for example, there's one where a uh, company, uh, CareFusion, started taking over another company. It was in a space where now, when you go into a hospital room and, and you or your loved one has tubes in them and they have saline, they have injectables and they have ports, one company, only one left. The problem you have with that is what if something goes wrong in those distribution lines? What if you, that's all in these, you know, those of us that know what manufacturing is like, things can go wrong in these clean room environments and you have one company producing everything in your US healthcare market and things go wrong and the prices haven't come down. And so we pay 40% more healthcare costs than anywhere in the world, in this country. That's because of monopolies. That's because of collusion between companies that provide you care. And if you wanna know what happened in Dallas, Texas, when the Ebola crisis came, and we had two people get Ebola in a healthcare system, I know that hospital. I tried to sell my product in the hospital. They would only buy off the contract with the bad product. The bad products they got during the Ebola crisis were hazmat suits that didn't work very well because they had one supplier left. The other supplier was a German supplier. They wouldn't buy from the German supplier. That's why those two healthcare workers were exposed to Ebola. And uh, Ross, you mentioned in your talk uh, that there's investors really want to hear the exit strategy before they invest in a company. They actually want to know who's going to buy you before they invest you in, in the company. Um, I actually had a startup years ago, and I remember just hearing from so many entrepreneurs that they had to really defend how it was that their business was not going to be immediately crushed by a tech giant. So, you know, what is it that you know, makes my business special that Amazon can't just copy it tomorrow and make me obsolete. So have you, uh, have you all seen that? And what do you think um, the effect on innovation is when, you know, every new company to get investment has to make that case? Yeah, it's, it's um, so if you're pitching and think of Shark Tank or some real world version of that, um, What's your exit strategy? Very, very common question you get, and you have to have a very, very straightforward story of who will acquire you, almost as a precondition. And if you say, listen, I want to be the next Americal Online in Washington, D.C., and I want to go public, and I want to make a bunch of people millionaires, the average venture capitalist won't take you seriously. That's not, that's not possible. Companies don't do that. Like, surely Comcast will acquire you, or if you're, if you're really good at what you say you're going to do. Um, so it's almost like the idea of building a great company is a myth. Facebook is the only company that started since 2000 that's currently in the top 200 companies, most valuable. Um, from 85 to 2000, there were over 20 companies that were in the top 20 most valuable in 2000. There's, there's been incredibly small turnover in the last 15 years in the Fortune 500. And so it's, it's almost like you need to be different enough to have a feature that is still interesting enough for Amazon or Facebook to want to acquire you to even, that, that is the incredibly limited design constraint on our innovation economy right now. Really? So I just, you know, part of the title of this symposium, I think, and I think Senator Warren spoke about is workers. Where does that all acquiring and merging and how does that help our workers, right? And so are our workers' wages increasing? You know, this piece of this monopoly problem I mean, that second tier of it is, what are workers supposed to do in this economy where they have no power? It's not like when they get these mergers and acquisitions besides the top C-suite that gets a you know, $20 million bonus, the guy working on the line that's making $15 an hour, how's this affecting him? And there's a lot of us that didn't want to be acquired. There's a lot of companies all across this country where you want to build a company, you want to help your community, you want to have a couple hundred workers, you want to give it to your kids. That's how this country was built. This other stuff we're doing now is just crazy. Um, I guess I can, so I don't, I don't think we ask companies like that, you know, to define what their exits, like what their, who their acquirers are going to be. Like a lot of our best companies are going to be companies that are 
independent and then possibly publicly traded. And, and so I don't know if I agree with that assessment. However, I mean, the <laughs> standard set of questions we would always be curious about with any company is, is defensibility. Um, and I actually think, um, you know, the, the, the way that the different, you know, four or five companies that are really uh, the, the, the largest, uh, the ones with the largest market caps, uh, the largest tech companies, I mean, they, they impact venture investment in different ways. So like, in the case of Facebook, obviously people are not making the several, same level of investments into social, or social consumer internet apps as they were like five to 10 years ago. And like I said, there's some aspects of that which I think are, 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 are good because there was a lot of frivolous stuff that was um, funded from that period that didn't really have, um, you know, didn't, a lot of frivolous apps that were funded from that period. But on the other hand, I would say there's a lot of, Facebook defines um, our norms of online and, and, and dis, online discourse and conversation. And there's probably a lot of interesting products out there and norms of conversation that we are not able to experience because none of those things ever um, takes off. On the other hand, Amazon is kind of, in, in certain ways, Amazon's presence is arguably beneficial to a lot of e-commerce. Um, startups um, that, that uh, because there's so many brick and mortar retailers that are pretty, um, frankly, um, in a state of crisis and like want to work with um, early stage e-commerce companies that could benefit them in terms of uh, new retail technologies or ways of distributing goods to consumers. So, I mean, they do actually do have Im different impacts on like kind of the landscape of, of, of early stage companies depending on which kind of sector you're in. So you're saying the crisis that Amazon is causing in brick and mortar is giving opportunities for startups to try to help them out of that crisis? Help, help brick and mortar companies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not, I mean, not what you would expect, but that, that is what we see and experience, so. You know, it's interesting. Um, so I write a lot for the Capital Forum about something. Wait, 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 I, oh. I, I want to okay. ask. <laughs> <laughs> Can, is there any evidence, um, get, just just a piece of data, just throw it out there, other than just speculation? It's not, so, I mean, like, is there, is I there, mean, there, uh, the Whole Foods Amazon deal was very, I mean, it was very positive for Instacart. How did, if, because a lot of grocery retailers were very concerned and wanted to, um, you know, they were going yeah, so, 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 so let's, I mean, let's get it's evidence. Different. Let's get yeah, evidence. Not for small farmers. Okay, yeah. so, so we, we invest in food and agriculture. We're yeah. the largest food and agriculture investors in the country. We have 14 investments in the agriculture mm -hmm. sector. 12 of the 14, the first store that yeah. took an opportunity on them was Whole Foods. Yeah. One of the first things that Amazon did after the acquisition was slash the SKEs. It's too expensive to have diversity of products. Yeah. Six of the 12 were completely unstocked. Yeah. And Amazon comes to them and say, that's okay, you can sell it online on Amazon. So net positive or negative for yeah, them. I, 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 I totally believe the, the, the notion that it could be really negative in the space that you work in, but then it, power is complicated. It has complicated impacts and it doesn't affect all other competitors in the exact same way. But I, you know, like that, that's just one instance where I would see perversely that's been a, a, an unexpected impact. Okay. Yeah. Or, okay. I, I still haven't heard any evidence, and I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, other than anecdotal, like, I mean, because in, Instacart. Oh, sorry. I'm, yeah. So I actually did write a lot about the potential harms of the Amazon Whole Foods merger. If anybody wants that, wants my analysis, I'll send it to you. Um, <coughs> But moving on to some of these bigger picture issues, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren was talking first about mergers and then about conduct, and we've saying that there's been not enough antitrust enforcement in the merger context, but also in the conduct context. And what I look, a lot, uh, look at a lot for the capital forum is something that I call platform privilege, which is kind of the incentive and ability for a tech platform to prioritize their own goods and services over those of competitors. This is the way, what the Google shopping case was about in Europe, where they um, the EU found that Google put its own comparison shopping results at the top of its search results and put competitors on page four, right? So, you know, this used to be called monopoly leveraging. There was actually antitrust law for monopoly leveraging. It just hasn't been enforced in a very long time. Um, there's some really bad precedent that needs to be challenged by bringing cases. Um, but I wanted to know, you know, in your experiences with the concentration and the effect on innovation, how much have you seen that scenario where there's actually a monopoly in one area 
that the monopolist then uses to take over all areas that are either maybe it's a vertical situation or they touch the market. Um, you know, has that been your experience at all? Um, like the monopolist that. Uh, well, and yeah. I'm, again, I'm from the healthcare market, not the tech sector, but in the healthcare market, that's exactly what happens, and that's why we have some of the worst health outcomes. Part of it is you know, somebody sells one line of products and because they're on contract and it's about fulfillment contracts, then they get to have their whole display of products. Well, one person may make the greatest stent, but they may not make the greatest, you know, defibrillate, you know. And these are where these uh, fulfillment contracts where the medicine, what we call the medicine middlemen, which Washington Muffley and other folks have written about, that's what the problem is and that's why we pay 40% more of healthcare costs. And in my company, when I sold into US markets, I got one price and I sold as high as I could because I was trying to make money for my small little company. And when I'd sell in Brazil, they had competitive bidding, something we don't know in our, in our healthcare market. We don't do competitive bidding in the US healthcare market. We just don't. And so I would sell to Brazil and I'd charge them if they would pay about a third less. Well, can I? Sure, I fine. just wanted to make a bridge, I think, between some of the dialogue about group purchasing organizations mm -hmm. in the healthcare context and sort of the role of platforms, I think, in the digital economy. But just to say that, you know, I, I, when I think about uh, the, the history of some of these group purchasing organizations in healthcare was that they would work with hospitals and they would say, oh, you're a little hospital, why don't we work together with like 50 hospitals and then we'll all do a big group purchase. Well, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that uh, it turns out there's all sorts of payments on the supplier side, right, that sort of end up locking in certain suppliers, and they're not really faithful uh, agents of their ultimate buyer principles. And I think that we're seeing a similar concern. We saw that concern with respect to the European case against Google, where you know I interviewed the folks that found them, who were part of the product comparison search, search engine, that Google essentially disappeared uh, along with other ones, once they wanted to, you know, sort of go uh, muscle into that market. And the idea in some of the statement of commitments that were even offered by Google to the EU before the case, you know, was taken on by Vestager, were to say that you need to have on the front page of search results a certain number of non-Google properties. I think that's a very important type of solution that we need to think about when you have these extremely powerful middlemen or platforms to say that, we want to create opportunities for consumers. We don't want to just have a situation where you're the person who's deciding. And it's really scary because when you look at the way in which Google is trying to reframe or to evolve as a company, sometimes these personal assistants, be they Google, Amazon personal assistants, others say, we don't want to give people 10 blue links. That's so, you know, 2008. What we want to do is just give you the answer. Right? But to just give you the answer, if they're going to do that, that involves deleting and setting aside tons of other opportunities. And I think the GPOs had a similar baleful effect with respect to some healthcare innovations. Yeah, I mean, so you're, you were talking about the purchasing orders, and even though um, that's not, you know, the problem is not just that they are the best, they're the best at the stint, but then they also bundle everything else with it so that if you have the best um, needle, you can't get into the market. Right. right, there's no opportunity, that's monopoly. They can't, there's no new entrants. And so, I mean, I literally can name off 35 companies that had best products and different product lines that are all no longer in existence. You know, over the time when I used to come up here and try to get us all into the market, they're all gone. My little company is still alive. I don't have any. I mean, they still run, but I'm saying it's very tough when you don't have market share in the major U.S. healthcare market and you're in the medical market. So a solution to that would be right. Are you, you want to say, Frank? You want oh, to? I just very quickly to say that I think that that's one of the defects of a lot of U.S. antitrust policy is that it doesn't adequately take into account quality. But I think uh, we need to also have a quality revolution and think about quality, not just price. Yeah. Right, and that's that would be like a tying or bundling claim would, would be what that could be well, under the antitrust uh, law. Unfortunately, for the last 20 years, what I've seen at the FTC is they have this goofy idea that only price matters to consumers. And that's not how, they, that's not the prism that one should look through. Okay, and um, I also wanted to touch on the concentration of funding. What are some solutions to make the funding less concentrated, and why is it important, not just for innovation and entrepreneurship, but for democracy, that there be equal access to funding? Sure. Um, I mean, if you look at how 
Do you look at how communities are sustained? Um, Lillian is running for Congress. Um, there is not a lot of money yet in investing in other parts of the country, so I'm one of Lillian's probably smallest donors. You but certainly are. I am. Uh, <laughs> we need to do something about that. I, yeah, but I, I think you should all donate to Lillian. But if you look at how campaigns are funded, if you look at how Little League teams are funded, if you look at how universities are funded, like people who make money largely determine the civic discourse. Um, and if you have highly concentrated, um, you know, if if Amazon puts Main Street Hardware Shop out of business, Amazon will not come in and sponsor the Little League team the next year. There are, there's importance in the outset for people all across the country to make money. And if, if lots of people are giving small dollars to campaigns or lots of people giving big dollars to Lillian, um, then, uh, then we have, I think, a more equal democracy. I think one of the issues is um, when you do, when you, the way most businesses are making money today are through large acquisitions. And I think the people who make money in large acquisitions are highly concentrated. And so I was, I've been looking at uh, way, companies that have created wealth for a very large number of people. And I tell the story in, in my book of New Belgium Brewing, which is a billion dollar company, Fort Collins, Colorado, they make fat tire beer. Um, they are one of the largest 100% employee owned companies we've ever seen. Janitors at New Belgium are gonna retire millionaires because the founder, Kim Jordan, figured out how to sell the company to her employees. So I went to Fort Collins, I walked around with these janitors who were gonna save for time. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing company. Um, and I asked people, I asked Kim why more people didn't do it. And she goes, first of all, I couldn't find a bank who would help me execute the sale. I ended up finding this boutique investment bank in Chicago called Eureka Bank that only does employee buyouts. But JP Morgan was my bank. And it, and it turns out you make about 10 times as much if you're an investment banker from a merger and acquisition as you do in an employee transaction. So bankers don't even have any incentive to recommend it. So, you know, I guess, I guess what I, I would say, that's one tactical example. There are lots of ways to make more people more money and very few people in the finance sector are incentivized to make them happen today. So now it's time to open up for questions from the audience. Anybody have any questions? Is there, is there a mic or no? Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, question for Lillian. Why don't the big companies buy up companies like yours? Do they figure out I could, uh, it's, it's easier to freeze you out and I'll make my own product instead, or my needle's good enough even though yours is better? Who right. cares? At the beginning, you know, we had an invention, we owned patents, we were fine about, we didn't necessarily want to be manufacturers, we were inventors, or my partner was, I was on the business side, and, uh, but when you got into the room with the 20 lawyers and trying to execute a deal, it was not to make the product. I mean, the John Grisham novels are true. It was. Not, I mean, you're signing, they're offering you a huge sum, but you're getting a royalty base, but part of the royalty base is that they'd make it. We were in the middle of an AIDS epidemic. We didn't think we had a choice morally not to make the product that could help protect nurses, so we walked away. Then we sued them, and then they had to pay us a lot of money. <laughs> sure, so I, I, I was, uh, I'm hoping that my language was more uh, studiedly ambiguous than that, but I, <laughs> in terms of saying that they had very good arguments under my theory. Um, but what I'm trying to point out, my, my main point on, on bringing up money under context is it's about priorities, right? It's about who do you decide, how do you decide to make law, what do you think it's important to make a stand on, and what not. And the agency is overwhelmed with consumer privacy antitrust problems. And to sort of take out of this massive group of potential actions, that one sends a very strong message. And it's a message that is about an endorsement at the highest levels of government of concentration and of technocratic ordering of markets by large Silicon Valley firms. That's what it's about. It's, it's, it's not so much about like, can we show our virtuosity and our legal reasoning? It's about saying, this is the company we think is the future, and we're throwing the weight of the government behind its business model when even the tiniest challenge to that business model emerges. Caroline? Hi, this question is for Kim. I'm wondering, um, from your perspective, what are the types of competition problems that keep small startups up at night? 
Um, are they seeing real barriers to entry that they can't get into in to compete? And if they are seeing bad anti-competitive conduct from the big platforms, are they willing to go confidentially and talk to the antitrust enforcers so that they have the opportunity to do something about it? I think it's easy for us to all say, yes, go after that bad conduct, but if you don't have people willing to come forward and tell them what that conduct is, you can't expect them to go to court and do things um, to stop it. Um, I think it probably, I mean, this stuff is so, this stuff is, I mean, it's like very, it, what happens is, I mean, it's very subterranean, if that makes any sense. So like over time, if people realize over the course of five years that there's been no breakout major consumer mobile internet app like Snap, that sort of becomes internalized, as you commented, into kind of the investing ecosystem, and then it just becomes institutionally or culturally more difficult for those concepts to, to be able to raise capital. And then you know those companies that would be interested in pursuing those ideas either can't raise follow-on capital or they can't raise capital to begin with in, in the beginning, and then they end up deciding to work on other concepts. So it's not so you know at this point like it would be really you know the the the, the in that particular sector um, things the actions that bigger players are have, are taking are so um, kind of preemptive that in many cases these teams are really small and they don't they actually don't know what their resources are and also you know these companies over time I mean if you think about Facebook in particular I mean two of Mark Zuckerberg's mentors are the mentors are mentors who came from the last major case you know like on the one hand like Bill Gates is a mentor to him on philanthropy and on the other side Mark Andreessen is his board member and so you know through that through those experiences, both Google and Facebook have become relatively sophisticated at understanding the policy landscape and then how to, you know, be able to act in a way that wouldn't trigger, you know, directly um, trigger those concerns. Um, and so, like a lot of small startups on the other side of two or three people don't understand. Um, yeah, you know, they, they don't. They don't either. Don't have the resources. They don't understand who to turn to or who to ask. Yeah. 